Well, I have about 35 big uh, regular farm tractors, internationals, and then there's probably 25 Cub Cadets and three hit and miss engines. <laughs> so a good sized barn, let's say that, yes, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doug is going to walk us around out here at the E-Town Fair's display of antique tractors and show us some of the more unique and interesting things that are out here today. A six, a helping hand with your land. How long have you worked for our company? I've been here in July, it was 46 years. 46 years! Seen a lot of progress. 46 <laughs> years before I was born. <laughs> yeah. Doug has uh, been a huge asset to our service department for a number of decades here and has an encyclopedic level of knowledge when it comes to old tractors. Right, this year we had approximately 86 items here, farm tractors of all flavors, uh, hit and miss engines, lawn and garden tractors, um, several unique pieces. Uh, right here we have a 1956 Farmall 200. It was fully restored. It's owned by Jeff Whitner, Whitmer from Mannheim. That tractor was originally sold by Messick Farm Equipment in 1956. His father had purchased it brand new there. Uh, it did win first place this year for the best restored tractor. So we're uh, kind of proud to have that here. What is, when this would have been new, do you know what the selling prices of these would have been? They were, uh, 70 the, years the ago? the 200s were right around $2,000. $2,000. Yeah. So technology-wise in this era, mid-50s, that the fast hitch would have been kind of the new thing? The fast hitch was new and unique. Before that, you had to bolt everything on the back on the axles, and these you just backed in and, and two latches snapped and away you went. I say as a neat, unique piece, and it's a Farmall Cub that was a cutaway. It, everything is cut apart, cut sections out of it so you can see the internals. It was either from International Harvester when they introduced the Farmall Cub in 1948, or it was from a technical trade school. But we, we're assuming the owner that owns it is assuming that it came from, from International Harvester but it's just a unique piece that everything is cut away so you can see the internals of it on both sides. From the muffler, the gas tank, the air cleaner, the radiator, the engine block, the center section, transmission. It's just, just a neat piece. What's this in here? That's the hydraulic system. It's, it was called touch control, but it moved this rock shaft. It was hydraulically, you could use it, it was live, whether the clutch was in or out. Okay and it moved this rock shaft to lift your cultivators, your plow, or whatever you had on the back. I did not know you had hydraulics on something of this age. Yeah. Hydraulics was very new then. That came out in the internationals in the, in the 40s. Huh. This year we're pleased to have in, in our display here a 1926 Frick Eclipse engine from Shope Farms in Middletown. He had bought this and did a lot of work to the boiler uh, but he fires it up here several times a week. Uh, it's just a unique piece. It's a steam traction engine. Uh, the engine itself, it, it was used mainly back in the 20s and 30s for belt power to run a thrashing machine. Uh, here in central Pennsylvania, they did not use them in the fields because they were too big and clumsy. But they used them a lot for stationary power to run sawmills, thrashing machines, that kind of thing. Uh, the steering is very crude. It has a chain in here that just wraps around the shaft to steer it, to, to, to angle your wheels. Uh, the engine is steam powered. It does not have reverse. You just reverse the whole engine when you want to <laughs> back up. So it's, it's a very crude piece, but it, it did the job and, and helped people earn a living. and benefit their families and move on. Just the springs in the wheels on here, is this suspension of sorts? That's just a suspension to take the shock load. Huh. But it has a big reservoir, it holds probably 150, 200 gallon of water, and you build a fire in it. He has, he has wood back here that he actually builds a fire in it to, uh, to propel it. But it was, it was very hot operation on a 100 degree day when you were thrashing to stand under there and maintain your controls and he had, he had to watch his gauges to maintain his steam pressure. 
Uh, that was very critical that you didn't get it too high. Well, then the relief valve would go off and blow, blow steam. Or if he didn't have it high enough or hot enough, then he wouldn't have power. So, so this is what? The sign says 50 horsepower. That seems... It's 50 horsepower on the belt. Okay. On the on the flywheel, so the traction here wouldn't be would be very little as far as power today. So really, it's not even though it's a traction engine, it's not necessarily something that you would be pulling with. No. It's in really... the west, some of them play situations they used them to plow with. Okay. But they never did around here. Our fields are too small even then. Yeah, it would take an acre <laughs> to turn it around. Yeah, right. <laughs> 1949 International 50T engine. It has a Continental engine on it, uh, supplied from the factory by IH back in that day. Uh, the tractor's end did not li have live PTO, so if you were going along and you wanted to slow down, there was a big hunk of hay coming. If it had PTO, you push your clutch in, the baler would stop. So they used engines on them, so you had a constant RPM speed. And uh, then as, as the 1950s came, live PTO came aboard where if you pushed in the clutch, your PTO kept running. And it made it very, very handy when you were bailing hay or, or any PTO work uh, that, that uh, you could keep on the move. <laughs> uh, the engines gave trouble. If it got hot, sometimes they wouldn't start, which was a major headache. Um, but other than that, why uh, that was a top of the line baler. So they, it, this it, is an IH, not a New Holland. This is an IH, yeah. So where where would have this come out of then? Chicago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it has twine tie on it. It's twine tie. Has a twine box on each side. And what? So it, it, this this knotter is basically the same concept as what a brand new. New Holland 5070 would have on today. Uh, it's the same. This knotter is the same concept. International had another knotter after this that made what they called a bow knot. Okay. But this is a traditional knot like we would have today. So you always hear about like New Holland's original knotters and stuff. That would have been before this or after this. This was right at the same time. Same time. This. So they both were developing knotter systems yes. independently of each yes. other. They look. In fact, in fact, the, the knotter that is on a New Holland baler today is called a Deering Knotter, which was patented after this one. Okay. Yeah, I say, that looks a lot more similar to... Yeah, it, it, it's almost identical. But that was, that was the top of the line bailer in 1949. Uh, it sold for like $1,500, $1,800, so... <laughs> have you run this before? I didn't run it lately, but I, I, have it, I had it running already. This is, uh, the hitch is something, that hole. Yes, yes, it was, it's a heavy brute. We have a 1940 Farm OM. This was the second year that they were produced. They came out in 1939 and they ran to 1952. It's probably one of International's most popular tractors. Uh, this one was a local tractor, bought new here in Elizabethtown at the Elizabethtown Farmer's Supply. A uh, man up the Hershey Road here by the name of Ed Gallagher uh, his father bought it brand new here. Uh, he passed away several years ago, but uh, it's, it's kind of like a one owner tractor, so. Yeah. So you said these are common, you see them yes, around. Yes, they're very, very common. And a tractor that you can still easily take to the field or not? I mean. Well, they're still used a lot on farms as a, as a, as a third tractor to pull wagons or anything light. Um, uh, rake hay, that kind of thing. Uh, they're, they're still very popular in the farms today. No three-point hitch. No on hitch this. at all. Right. So you're, yeah, you're pulling wagons. It, it does much. have hydraulic system on it, uh, single acting, just one hose. <laughs> so um, it's not a high pressure system. It has about a thousand psi hydraulic pressure. So a little limited in what you're going to do with it, but yes. for a, a getting but it, out. It, and it's a stuff 45 around. horsepower tractor. Right. And what do you pay for one of those today? The average one, nice one, good rubber, nice sheet metal, is going to be in the two thousand dollar neighborhood. Okay. And that's that's a little more than what they cost new. Yeah. Uh, new this in the nineteen forty was probably fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Here we have hit and miss engines. This is a New Holland, a nineteen eleven. This is what put New Holland on the map. Uh, 
if you can see the water jug, the, the water tank in here is cast iron and it's shaped on a wedge on a taper. And that was designed so that you could let the water in it and it freezes, it wouldn't break it. Hmm. It would just push it up. And that was a great selling feature. Back then they did not have antifreeze and a lot of engines were destroyed because they would freeze and it would just break right, and destroy it. But that was made in New Holland, Pennsylvania in 1911. <laughs> this gentleman has a cider press. Uh, a couple nights a week, here he makes cider, puts apples in it, grinds it up, puts it in this basket, compresses it, runs the juice out in a jug. Yeah, it's good. I got ice cream from the one back here last night. <laughs> yeah. These are hit and miss engines that would have been used anywhere from in the house to run the washing machine, turn a butter churn, run a saw, meat grinder, anything that you would use an electric motor for today, they use, use these for. It's always surprising to me that you can transfer power through the belt. Because whenever you see the belt running on one of these, it always looks so sloppy. Mm -hmm. but I guess what, it's getting enough traction on it gets the a, It gets enough traction, and now in, in applications like back in the day when you ran a blower at the silo with it or a feed grinder, you had to have them pretty tight mm. for, for- Where you're actually really putting load where on Where you it. were putting a heavy load on This is a 1924 Ford Roadster pickup. The gentleman brought in, it was the first time this year that, that he just purchased it from an older gentleman that was retiring, but in 1924, that's the kind of vehicles that would be running around in the roads. Here's a 1974 1066. Now this is painted, some of the colors are a little off with the cab. The gray in it was not factory. Uh, that gentleman restored it. He thought it was too much red and he added that on his own. But <laughs> uh, it's a very nice restoration, but... Uh, Does he run this at all? No, he d he it, had just has as a toy and has play uh, play hay, hay rides play and, tractor. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful tractor. What so like brand wise when you're looking at what all is out here? Like we always just generally think of IH and Deer mostly, right? Mm -hmm. But you go around and there's Oliver's, there's a cock shut down there. There's what else is around here? Well, in Alice our, behind in, us in, in our area here in Elizabethtown. Years back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, we had an Alice Chalmers dealer at Reams. We had a Case dealer at Reams. We had a Minneapolis Moline dealer at Reams. And we had an international dealer. We had a John Deere dealer at, at Mount Joy. Um, we had a big Oliver dealer at Mannheim. So we kind of have all them mixtures in this area. It kind of, it kind of went in, in your area what your dealer was. Uh, you know, some, some places only had a deer dealer, some places only had an IH dealer. So that's kind of what the people favored. They, they, they always purchase local. So yeah. uh, well, it's not unlike today, right? No. I mean, we always say it's, it's by what you have good support for, yes. almost above yes. all. While we have everything, I mean, it's those companies were all what developing at basically kind of the same rate through those years, or was one a standout over the other at that point? Or, well, they each had their own niche. Uh, like in the '50s, International came with their fast hitch, which is supposed to be a quick hitch, hook and unhook. Alice Chalmers had their snap coupler. Uh, Case had their eagle hitch, which was similar to to our quick hitch we have today with our claws. Um, so Ford and Ferguson had their three-point, like we have today. So way before any kind of standardization of three-point hitches. What about the PTO? Is the PTO common across all of those or not? Well, in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, they decided to make that standard. Okay. Uh, before that, it could be any dimension from the hitch, and it could be any diameter. When they first started out, it was an inch and eighth shaft, and now it's inch and three-eighths. So. Um, so the PTO shaft itself was one of the first pieces then that was actually standardized. That was standardized. one of the first that was standardized. Huh. And, Oliver's and then, cool. then each one came with their own hitches and nobody wanted to give in and let, let everybody have it. Yeah. Um, so they were playing the game of proprietary stuff. Yes. Long before today. Yes. <laughs> and then somebody wised up and said, hey, let's make it all, yeah. all three point that everybody's standard. And that was, that was a great thing. But, the IH quick hitch, fast hitch, uh, 
to me, it's still the best. It's the fastest to hook and unhook, and but <laughs> they they wouldn't give it up. So that's yeah, they lost it. Here's two Farmall Cubs that are painted the wrong color. Uh, this one, a gentleman came into work one day and said, I have an old Farmall Cub up at my cabin. He said, if you know of anybody that wants it, they can have it. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> so one weekend, we took my granddaughter. She was less than a year old and took her along and picked this tractor up. And that was probably seven years ago. And she, uh, one day I decided, well, I'm, I'm going to give it to her. And I said, what color do you want it? She said, pink. So I made it pink. That, that took a piece out of my heart to paint a nice cub pink, but uh, it's your grandchildren. And then her brother, I had a little cub that I got very reasonable and he wanted his blue. And I said, that was the worst day of my life to paint a red tractor blue. <laughs> when you go through and you, you do a paint job on a tractor like this, before somebody just grabs a spray can and goes after something, what, what does your process look like when you paint a tractor? Well, to do them right, th these I kind of did a quick job because I knew <laughs> someday the down the road kids. I'm praying they want them back again. <laughs> they want them red. But to do a nice job, you have to w pressure wash it, get it clean. And then the second step, most all of them have a lot of rust and you're best off just to sandblast the whole tractor and then put a good coat of primer on it and a good coat of paint. So how much how much disassembling of the tractor do you do when you paint like that? It depends just... on its condition, what it means. If it runs good and has no oil leaks, you can just sandblast the whole tractor okay. and paint it. A so, lot of people, a lot of times, they have oil leaks all over them that you have to fix. Um, maybe the engine needs freshened up, needs new rings, bearings. Um, of course, then you're going to want to tear it down, and, and that th that is known as a full restoration. Okay. Over here, we have lawn and garden. Uh, the later uh, 84 782 diesel, which is a kind of a rare tractor. Yeah. Uh, this is where Cub Cadet started, 1961. It's known as a Cub Cadet original. Uh, International wanted to get in the lawnmower business, and they come up with this. The transmission is the same as this big Farmall Cub over here, but it's the same transmission. They used that for a lot of years in the gear drive version. Huh. But um, they have Kohler engines in them, 10 horsepower, so. What about the loader? Is that original too? That, that was a company that, that International dealt with, Danco. They made a lot of loaders. They made industrial mowers, belly mowers for uh, parks and, and highways. Okay. Um, but it was, it was kind of a, an aftermarket company that International promoted. The Shepard Diesel, they were made in Hanover, Pennsylvania, local tractors. Um, company is no longer, well, the company is in business, they make power steering units for trucks. But uh, this is a 1952. They were not super popular. They were kind of a heavy tank type tractor for their time. So. Huh, but actually made in Hanover. Made in Hanover. Did not know that. These are the later Cub Cadets, these red ones, a 1282, 982. That's, that's the last version of right before International Harvester sold it to MTD. Um, these are in the, in the eight, early 80s. Yeah, they're desirable tractors. Even I know to look for them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a special one. It's a Farmall B, BN. It's a 1947. Uh, it's one of our workers at, at uh, Messix. Uh, he restored it. Uh, he added the second seat on this side so he can take a passenger with. Um, that was not factory equipped that hmm. way. But uh, the holes were all there and, and uh, the mounting brackets all line up for the seat. So it's, uh, it became very popular for show tractors for people to do that. So uh, they are. Uh, 25 horsepower tractor um, it, that that was designed back in the day it would run a two-row cultivator all the corn and, and everything was cultivated for weed control uh, so that was that was one of the first tractors that had two, the two-row cultivator before that it was just one row so it was it was a big improvement if if you were looking at one of these tractors today 
and your intention was to go out and work it. What kinds of things should you be looking for? Well, um, or is that even possible? Can you can you take a seventy year old machine today and do? It, it'll still do what it is intended to do if you want to torture yourself and <laughs> and I mean all the attachments for this the plow cultivator bolted onto the to the tractor physically bolted uh, nothing quick attach um, it took time and it was a lot of levers and linkage and and it's a pile of stuff when you when you look at it to store it whether you want to handle it um, it was just a job. So attachments are the problem then? The attachments are the problem. Okay. It, it's just a bare bones tractor. There's no hydraulics on it. Right. So, you know, if you want to pull a wagon or, or whatever, yes, it'll do perfect. But as far as plowing or, or mowing, I mean, if or, you have yeah. mowing or anything like that, you have no way to lift it. Um, but, but as far as just doing tractor work you know, I mean if you want to pull logs out of the woods or whatever yeah. it, it'll do that but uh, yeah you're, you're I guess you're just you're limited you're, you're to just the, so limited to the drawbar yes yeah but that that's a 1924 <laughs> version horse and a half and like we said before that was used you know, around the farms uh, run the wash machine run the butter churn run a run a saw to cut firewood for the stove or, or uh, to heat um, <laughs> yeah and you know, one of the special things about that, this is another another employee, right? <laughs> yes. uh, ben Williams from our setup department is the one that brought this in. Yes. The Farmall Super M, uh, 1953, that, that is what your grandfather would have started selling, that okay. model there. Um, they were rated at 50 horsepower, uh, brand new, equipped like it is there, it was probably $2,500. <laughs> so, uh, that was his start. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. For meeting us out here today, sharing your wealth of knowledge. <laughs> glad I to know do it. Uh, every time I get one of those phone calls with somebody that starts asking questions about their old farm, well, I know who to transfer it to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be glad to help you out. <laughs> Special thank you to Doug for coming out here today, spending some time with us. When you call in and you start asking questions about your tractors, what you might be doing, fixing things that you're wrenching on in your barn and that kind of thing, this is often the guy that helps you out. He is an absolute wealth of knowledge. So thank you for your service. Glad to help. Time out here today. <laughs> if you have any parts needs for machines you've got, you're shopping for a piece of equipment, or if you have something we can help you get fixed, give us a call at Messix. We're available at 800-222-3373 or online at Messix.com. <laughs>